Hello everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program, Episode 6, More Fun with Jets. Unlike my Soviet compatriot, I'm going to show you the build process on building a slightly bigger, slightly better jet plane than what we were using in our previous episode. And see, I'm starting off with the best cockpit we have currently available, and a small cargo bay. Um, I like to do kind of an avionics package um, in the forward area of the airplane. Um, in here, I will usually put things like batteries, um, sat map stuff, a mechjet module for uh, reference information. I already said batteries, didn't I? Well, here I am actually putting in said batteries. Um, as you can probably tell, all of this is being presented in two times time acceleration because nobody wants to watch an hour-long video of me piecing things together. Oh, comms equipment. Gotta have comms equipment. And uh, as when I recorded this video, the uh, sat map stuff wasn't quite working right, but uh, it was just a misplaced DLL. Um, it's been fixed as of the recording of this narration, which is a, a few days down the road. Uh, I apologize. I'm trying to get better about getting this stuff uh, more current and more frequently, but, you know. There's also life to live, jobs to work, money to be made, heads to crack, etc., etc. So, more batteries because I like to run the lights on the aircraft and fly at night such and such. Uh, this will just be uh, an atmospheric only aircraft. Um, and when I was building this one I did not have Ferrum Aerospace installed. And I'm um, starting to discover that Ferrum Aerospace is kind of like cheating. But um, the goal was to build something to carry a 12 ton cargo, uh, a sustained flight of Mach 2 for 200,000 kilometers. This plane um, could probably carry the cargo weight, but without Ferrum Aerospace, it's never going to hit that kind of speed. That's just the way things are. So, back to our cargo bay, and since we're not really worried about the secret project the Kremlin has assigned for us yet, we're just going to load this one up with scientific equipment and sensors and such in hopes of hitting a few biomes on uh, a flight or two. Really a, a good long-range craft if you've got the time to sit down and just biome hop from place to place is a great way to pick up a lot of cheap science uh, all around Kerbin. And uh, hitting those different biomes and stuff made a lot easier with a working sat map mod, something that will tell you where the biomes are. So otherwise you're kind of left flying around and doing crew reports and hoping that it tells you a different biome when you're over it. So our previous uh, jet research vehicle had four of these in the cargo bay. Uh, we're going to do more than that since it's going to be literally twice as powerful and have about twice the range. So. Um, by that mathematics, we should be able to carry almost twice the payload, but um, it's not actually how things go. Uh, this little science part's from the Universal Storage mod. Uh, if you're close to an anomaly, it'll give you a pretty interesting scientific message. And free science points also, which is another way to help unlock cheap things. Yeah, six might be a bit much. No, eight or seven might be a bit much. Six is a good number. We'll go with six. And we'll just get something here eventually. Uh, the space plane hangar makes things a little tricky as far as not having that uh, snap to angle thing on. Very, very useful normally. Not so much here. Um, and I have noticed that the B9 parts did not benefit from the joint reinforcement of the .235 or the .23.5 update. So uh, it does help to strut the living hell out of everything when you're using B9 parts, uh, especially wing structure and stuff like that. Otherwise, you get a lot of wobble. 
But all right, we got six of those, so we should probably take six of these, right? Now we can go back to. Take a few atmospheric pressure scan thingies, some temperatures, because this is really the most high-tech stuff that I have. And always a big plus to bring the seismic data back, so we'll throw six of those on too. And action groups, because if you want to get science in mid-flight, you really don't want to have to open the cargo bay. I really don't think it makes, um, I don't think it has an effect on the aerodynamic model. I'm not 100%. Part of me is a little too scared to try. But action groups, awesome. I actually remember long enough ago when KSP first added action groups. It was kind of brilliant. Suddenly all of my solar panels could open all at the same time as my satellite crashed firing back to Kerbin. Oh, good times. When there was only Kerbin and the moon, and getting to orbit was hellish. Can you imagine if I had done this in regular speed? How crazy, insanely long this would all be? <laughs> I don't even really have the patience for that. I love watching people's build videos. I, I really do. But sometimes. Man. Wow. Alright. Let's get on to what makes this thing go. Need some fuel tanks. Again, these are from the B9 parts pack. They hold uh, 980 liquid fuel only. Which is quite a lot of fuel. I mean, just like a lot takes quite a while for a, even one of those high burn in jet engines to tear through that. So we'll add more. Why not? Uh, should we go delta wing? Standard wing? I haven't unlocked the really big B9 wings yet. Like the, the huge jetliner wings like on the, oh, what's it called? The Strakowski? Stratovsky? Yeah, I don't know. Alright, again. Strutting the hell out of everything because B9 did not get the uh, joint reinforcement. But really, I struts... It's a little mass. It never hurts to just go ahead and strut the hell out of absolutely everything. And this stuff especially because that's going to end up being a uh, load-bearing structure. Wings are always the stupid part here. They always take forever to find the right combination of what looks right, what's going to give you the lift, and what's going to keep it where you want it to be. So see, I've turned on the center of mass and the center of lift uh, icons there. Now there's, I've heard a lot of different things out there in YouTube land, but um, as far as like actual aerospace engineering goes, if you have that center of mast just a little bit ahead of the center of lift, uh, you will actually have a very stable aircraft. Um, really the, uh, the tailplane, the elevators at the back uh, near the rudder are designed to actually, um, well their, their wing shape form on real airplanes is a little inverted to help uh, pitch, change the pitch angle of the aircraft when it's in motion. Um, real airplanes also have a trim setting, which I know you can set a trim setting here in Kerbal Space Program also. You do that by hitting ALT. I believe, and your uh, WASD key or E key, 
I mean, we'll set trim, but that uh, that trim setting is kind of like a re-zeroing. You know how you tear a scale when you're weighing something? It's kind of like doing that. It gives you adequate compensation. But yeah, the, um, the rear elevators at the back of the plane are actually uh, flipped around on some real airplanes to counteract that uh, that pivot point between the center of mass and the center of lift. This provides a very stable uh, flight characteristic, um, even at speeds uh, up to and right around Mach 1. Now, uh, things do change quite a lot when you get to Mach 1. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the X-Planes project, which uh, very barely predated the Mercury program, was uh, really kind of tasked with uh, first breaking the sound barrier and then just seeing how incredibly fast we could go. Um, these pilots like Chuck Yeager, who uh, initially broke the sound barrier in a Bell X-1. I, I, it was basically a, a, a small rocket with uh, small stubby wings. Um, but it was to uh, research the effects of extremely high-speed flight. And it was a very dangerous program out there in California. And I think something like uh, 17 pilots died in a couple of years they were running the program. Oh, I've never... I've never liked reverse Delta Wing aircraft. That's just me. Sorry, I just I I just don't like the way they look. I like a good swept Delta style wing. That's almost cool. Yeah, then once we get some control services on here. Everybody likes a nice fixed trailing edge, right? It does give you a good solid point to uh, attach struts. I think also we're going to do a hard point here under the wings. If we decide to add some engines to this design later, they can go here, mounted low. Uh, if we decide we want to go the military route and add some ordnance, they can go there too. Those are a bit big. Let's get the little ones. That's the hotness. Now, little hard points like that will also help you run struts, since your wings may be longer than the maximum allotted distance for a strut. It's uh, nice to have something there you can triangulate from. Alright, we should probably slap some intakes on this. Which, of course, uh, we're going to have to move these wings, aren't we? Dag it. Mm -hmm. Just move the wings, old me. Oh. oh, bummer, those look terrible. Yeah, alright. We're just gonna go with the stocks. Uh -huh. Ooh. I like that much more. Let's see, now back to kind of what I was talking about before with center mass and center lift. Um, the center mass slightly ahead of the center lift is how most commercial planes, heavy cargo planes, stuff like that will do it. If you're building something where you want a lot more agility, pegging the two right on top of each other, kind of how this one is, will make your aircraft a lot more nimble, but um, it will create some instabilities as far as uh, ex at uh, higher speeds or while accelerating. The craft is going to want to be neutral. But uh, you can... You can shift the direction in which it's being neutral. Alright. Does that make sense? It doesn't make any sense to me. Oh well. I'm not an aerospace engineer. Uh, 
I really like those engines from B9. Now, the, uh, the strut syndrome again. Because my wings have a tendency to flop around a whole lot if I don't strut the hell out of them. And really, I'd much prefer a rigid airframe. If I wanted something that flops around, I'd go build something out of the uh, canvas parts from Fire Spitter. Not my favorite, but man, I'd, they are really cool looking. Alright. That's, uh, that's not a bad airframe there. Now, something else I've discovered about these B9 wheels is while they are rugged and extra cool looking, you need to have them mounted straight down or they tend to snap. And they look about even too, which is awesome. And what would a good airplane be if it didn't have air brakes? These are air brakes are probably the coolest, most useful thing as far as making a nice, safe, steady landing on something. I love me some air brakes, especially because using wheel brakes tends to make things want to flip forward or to the side, you know, whichever. All right, bind them to an action group. Yep. All right, moving right along. We need a tailplane. So should we do Beechcraft style? Man, those are huge. Nah. Well, let's just do the one. Let's do an angle snap. Boom. Yeah, I like that a lot more. You can make small adjustments to the angle of things like that by holding the shift key and your WAS and Ds to move them around. But it is literally impossible to hit the, the right key on the first try. Just saying. Alright, now we're going to specify our control surfaces. The rudder at the back, get some lights. And I'll say, I know we mentioned something in our previous episode about uh, ailerons, elevators, <laughs> rudder flaps. Uh, I just learned a new term actually watching a documentary about the uh, SU 27, the SU. 27 family of uh, fighters from Russia called flaperons. Now, flaps technically are used to increase the surface area of a wing to increase its lift potential uh, at the cost of also increasing drag. Now, what flaperons do is they function both as ailerons, which are your roll authority, but in takeoff and landing to increase the uh, lift surface on a wing they extend down like the uh, flaps on a jetliner. Like if you're sitting over the wing on a big jetliner and you're coming in for takeoff or landing you see that the uh, the flaps proper because the, they're not truly a control surface as far as they don't help you with your roll, pitch, or yaw authority. They only extend out and down during takeoff and landing to basically make more wing surface and create more lifting force, uh, which you need at lower speeds. And on the SU-27, and it's like the SU-27, the SU-30, the SU-33, and the SU-35, uh, the landing flaps act also as uh, ailerons on the wing, so it's one control surface that has a, a multifunction. Now I know on like uh, stuff like the Eurofighter, where it's got elevators, they're also flaps also, so they're flap elevators. Elevators, ailerons, and flaps, all combined into one. Alright, time for our first test flight, so we'll punch it and see how this puppy flies. As you can see, still no fair amount of space. I'm sure I've already mentioned that part. Alright. It's off the ground nice and easy. It's a lot better than our last one, which had to literally fall off the end of the runway to get enough speed under the wings. Mm -hmm. Climb characteristics look pretty good. Mm 
All right. So far, still nice and stable. We're going to turn west here, and uh, one, we're going to do a speed test, two, we're going to do an altitude test or a ceiling test, and three, we're going to do a range test. Um, good thing is, we can do all three of these all at the same time, although, notably, we won't really be able to get uh, a good deal of speed out of this thing until we burn off a lot of fuel, because uh, it is quite heavy, but I guess the whole point of this exercise is to see how big of a cargo we can take up at what speed. And uh, I always like to test my craft with time warp just to kind of see how things behave. And this one's got kind of a weird yaw to it. And you can actually see the rudder tipping to the side. But um, I don't know if that's uh, ASAS doing that or if it's just something weird. Not ferrum. But anyway. Uh, it doesn't spin wildly out of control, which is pretty awesome. Let's get some altitude here. So you kind of want to fly either above the clouds or below them, but really for what we're trying to do above them is definitely what we want. So we'll probably fly out west till we've burned out about half our fuel and then turn around and then do the altitude and speed runs on the way home once most of our fuel is gone. But uh, when we get to about the halfway burnt fuel mark, That'll give us a pretty good indicator of what our range is going to be. Now again, since the aircraft is lighter when it's got less fuel, your, your, your range at half tank is going to be greater than your range at full tank. Yep. Still doesn't work. And opening and closing that had no effect on the flight characteristics, which I, I guess is pretty good. I mean, for gameplay. Not good for realism. Good for gameplay. Now, huh. Getting up there in altitude. I'm pretty happy with this little guy. I'm not the fastest in the world. Definitely very, very nimble. His turn characteristics are great. Keeping it from stalling is also pretty cool, but as far as running these bad boys at full throttle, we can probably do it for quite a while, but there's that uh, wacky yaw, but it's not causing any major instabilities. It is kind of throwing off our heading, which is going to make navigating a little more interesting, but <laughs> I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, I'm pretty good at navigating. I was a Boy Scout. I can read these things. I know how to read a map. I know how to tell heading and stuff. So we can deal with a couple of pitch degrees off every now and again. Let's make up for it. Try to keep a little more altitude. I don't know if we're actually going to see the service ceiling on this particular leg of the flight. But, uh, you know, never know. Now, um, anybody who's been attentive to my build process and this flight so far, you've probably noticed that I forgot something. Any guesses? Any guesses? Hmm. Well. We'll get to it, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Hello. Well. That was interesting. I guess I should just go ahead and leave the stability control on. That's fine. I have no qualms about flying with the computer helping me out. That's how real pilots do it. That's how the real space program does it. That's just how things are for real. Sorry if you feel like that's uh, terrible and whatnot. We got a big ocean to cross and lots of time warp to do it with. Really, I don't think that a 10-degree glide scope is all that bad. 
we can maintain our altitude and keep our speed up and I mean real planes all have that glide slope also and that's just the difference in the uh, degree pitched up nose up that you are versus your angle of level of flight and that angle will change based on altitude and airspeed and a few other factors too but uh, for the size and weight of this aircraft that 10 degrees isn't so bad so yeah, on to what I forgot, in case you haven't guessed it already. Um, I forgot to put fuel lines between the two fuel tanks. As you can see down there in the uh, bottom left, my fuel is burning off differently, which would cause two engines to flame out for the other two. I think I could run this thing on two engines. I'm not particularly wanting to try. So what we're going to do is just set our course for a nice flat chunk of land here to the west, probably that big desert out there, and uh, we'll see as far as we can go without flaming an engine out before we have to uh, set it down for an emergency landing. But uh, that seems like a good enough place to leave this one, so thanks for joining me everybody. I am the Cosmonaut. If you like this video, please hit like uh, or subscribe. If you didn't like this video, please hit like anyway and tell me why you hated it in the comments. Uh, until next time, I will see you later.